for the presentation on this search. Um, I'd like to welcome our two speakers for today. We have Kelsey Tucker from Cambridge University, who will be presenting to us about the impacts of fire intensity on above ground and below ground biodiversity. And we also have James Rule from Geology and Zoology, uh, who are presenting the identification of fossil fragments from the Miocene Pliocene boundary in Southern Australia. Um, now, the sessions will be started, so we have 15 minutes for each speaker, and then we'll have five minutes of question time at the end of the speaker. Um, I've got these uh, cards for the speakers, one I've got five minutes remaining, so I've got two minutes remaining, I hope you'll like to show you this card for that it comes up. Um, yeah, we'll get started now, so I'll welcome and come to the stage. Well, and then see fire burning for a long time. So, 
can see the fuel track configuration that's how hot a fire is. And when you consider that soil is uh, in the top five centimeters of the majority of wet seeds around, um, this can be quite a different. I don't know if you can see the issues here, but that's about three or five centimeters. So you can see it's like quite a so this graph was um, computed using the um, well, input um, seeds in the oven for various durations and temperatures. And um, so that's duration of the oven and the temperature of the oven. So we've got lower, go to higher generation proportion of proportion of that seed level. So immediately you can see that it varies. Um, so if say we had a low intensity fire around 40 degrees or so, it might not promote much germination. I think up to 100, you get quite a good peak. And then down to 120 for, I mean, so it's lower germination around 120 is likely to be due to seed mortality. So this just highlights varying sensitivity of um, species. So the high wind speeds and the low humidity affected high severity fires in 2009, and that represents the uh, black area of the severity is both cut out of um, duration and time of the fire, and this measured uh, with the vertical scorch and vegetation. So the black area is 100. But there's also some green and uh, green and orange areas where we've got more black deep squash. And so this provides a bit of consistent funding and understanding the effects of fire severity. My first aim was to determine which severity category can have a very high diversity. And would that be unburned, low, or high? With low just being a bunch of story by finding the consumption of the energy. And does fire severity change the community assembly? So, what do you think of the My sites are around central Victoria, and then seven per category, high low number, and they're fairly well friendly in separate things like the other variety. The above ground was surveyed by the Department of Environment and Primary Industries. So you can see the scotch heights in the tree there. And my job was to sample the seed bank. And I did it for the little line to see above ground things. So that we could um, them. And we sampled in April when the seed bank began to be made. Things were set seed and get to turn. So it's quite a laborious process if you want to go through the soil and uh, put ground on the seeds. So instead you apply various treatments to maximize germination. So you have heat and smoke and the plant hormones are relatively and typically it's intense to see what kind of damage. So as your results, which severity and category has the greatest diversity? So we have I don't know, but then these nutrients, which is the number of species per that, and this is a significant difference. So it seems that um, both the high and low aren't having any, both seem to have any effect on diversity, which is a good sign, at least just at the number of species level. And then the interest in the ink in the seed bank. Um, both high and low are significantly lower than the unburned category. So this suggests that um, things in high and low are yet to uh, replenish and to be declaimed that the things haven't matured enough to set the heat and turn into soil. Or alternatively, things could be improved by that. But it would seem the above. Uh, 
And so for my second end, just by some variables if we use some dish. Uh, this is just the view of the view that you think um, a scaling technique, not a scaling technique, which um, places points which have shared presence or absence of species closer together and those which do not share further apart. And the axes here are just represented in different combinations of presence and absence of the curve, which is mostly not that big. And so you can see there's three distinct groups that come out, which suggest that bisecurity is having an influence on the community structure. So even though PC fiction is still the same, um, what is making up that number is PC fiction. And then we can see thing. Um, it's roughly a similar pattern, however, you can see that high and low are quite similar, which might suggest that they are replenishing with similar species, maybe dispersing into their area, or it could be that there is some seed left after the fire. Yeah. And um, those three groups are significant at the 0 0.001. And to bring it all together, so what happens is the above ground vegetation um, affected by fire at a high severity is more likely that trees, trees or other life forms, other components of the vegetation, um, lose, lose their leaves, but if they have various amount of tissue and like their regenerative tissue within the side of the plant, that's still all right, then it is roots back or but it's still the importance of the soil seed bank decreased. And so then, yes, if we have fire, and it's very, um, the seeds are relatively more consistent than a lot of the background vegetation, but a lot of shrubs and smaller things, um, they actually obligate these seeding, so they have to rely on the seed bank for regeneration, generally can't be sprout. And if they're in that sweet spot within the soil depth and um, the temperature is good, then they might emerge with the light and opening of the nutrients, it's also associated with fire. If they're in viral through decay, then they're not going to be affected. Um, well, that is a high risk though for that species because if they kill by fire and they're um, seen through fire, they're likely to come over the leaves in that area. And then that's a few species of Like for that um, native deer that I had, the germination surface spot, um, you might have quite low germination and there was a very bad. Or it could be five centimeters. Um, the next step in my project is to measure plant traits such as seed mats and hard seed in and see how they um, um, There's also an important question about replenishment of the seed bank, which is important under uh, increased biofrequency. And how will vegetation respond under a change in life with increased intensities? So, is there more food bags and more floods for the future? Mm. So just with the um, graph you did before on the diversity of the seeds with the um, yep, that one. Yeah. And you know, how we've got a high diversity for unbirds, um, of that might implicate that the fire is a selection factor on the seed level. So I was just wondering, have you looked into at all the diversity after the bushfire period? And if it bounced back? Uh, or yes. Um, so this is measured this year. Yeah. Uh, 
from the person six. And so, how about the name of that? I'll get into the phylogenetic relationships. So we have tri and Ikea, the super family here, and the clade of Predicules starts here, and tri and Ikea starts somewhere around there. And yeah. And all these um, things that are top here, they are the um, genesis within those families, but due to the fact that it's a fossil fragment, we can't go down to genus for the identification, we have to stick to that. Right, so suspects at the family level. We have the trilakids, which are commonly known as soft shell turtles, and they have fossils known in Australia, however, there is no trilakids living in present day Australia. And the important part about them is that they have no critical bones and they have no scoots, which are sort of uh, horny epidermis on the top of their shell. And reticulates are known all over from the northern hemisphere and from Papua New Guinea. But there are no fossils of predicules in Australia. And the only living um, specimen from the family Predicularidae in the entire world lives in Northern Territory and Papua New Guinea and is known as Predicules and Sculptor. So I'll just introduce that specimen. They're commonly known as the Pitmos turtle and this one here. And Predicules and Sculptor, as I said before, lives only in Northern Territory and Papua New Guinea and has a mainly aquatic lifestyle. And due to this, the females are the only sex that ever leaves the water, and they only ever leave the water to lay the eggs. And when the eggs hatch, they need to be submerged in water, so they're hatching flood plants. And this is in contrast to every single other tetrapod where the egg is submerged into water in the ground. And therefore, the earliest sort of record of Predicules and Sculptor is from roughly 7,000 years ago from, in Australia from cave paintings. And the current theory, due to the lack of fossils of Predicules in Australia, is that the pygmy turtles migrate from Papua New Guinea into the Northern Territory. And this is just an idea here of the pygmy turtle distribution. So the red dots are confirmed sort of sites that they've been noted in, and the green shaded area is their theorized distribution. But before we get to the taxonomy of the specimen, we have to do the morphology to check whether it's a predicate or triangle. So what part in a shell was the turtle from? And here's a bit of basic shell morphology. So for this we'll just talk about the bones, which are on the left side, and you have the fossils and the peripherals, and the fossils are in line with the ribs, and then you have the bones of the plastron, and the carapace is the dorsal or top part of the shell, and the plastron is the ventral or bottom. Right, so I'll just go on to describe the shell material. So it has five sides. Sides one and two are the natural edges, so they are the distal part of the shell. Sides three and four are the eroded surface, and size five used to be an eroded surface, but it is where we made the cut for the pin section. And the epidermal side has the surface sculpture, as seen as this microscope over here. And there is no scoop softly present, which means the turtle that had this had no scoops, which is in line with trimakids and predicates. And the visceral side is smooth, though there are signs of a broken bone layers as indicated here. And the important thing is that there is an axis on an upturned edge, which means on the dorsal side the bone is inflected on an angle like so. And in the cross section we have a diploid structure, so it's a sandwich, sandwich layer of four cool bones, so up here and down here, and you have the spongiosa in the middle, and this is consistent with turtle histology. And we also have an asymmetrical pigment on the bottom side of the specimen. Right, so the natural edges of P161476 means there is a distal or outer part of the shell, so here or here. And there is an angle of roughly 960 degrees between the natural edges. And this means that it can either be only from the anal notch, so the back of the plastron, or the peripheral of the actual buttress, which is the side of the carapace. So I'll go into reason as to why it's not an anal notch. The thickening would only be consistent on the plastron if there was an ilium bone present, which is this right here. And Crodigulis and Triadites don't have any bones. And another important thing too is that the angle of 96 degrees is way too sharp to be a part of the specimen to be from the 
And so reasons in support of a peripheral axial buttress. The axial buttress is roughly around here, and some credit peripherals are known to be upturned. And fossil credit peripherals are also known to have angled neck um, edges. And indeed, some studies have shown that credit fossils have angles from between 90 to 100 degrees, which is consistent with P161476. And the thickening of the asymmetry of the axial buttress is consistent with this part that's shown here. And also, they mediate genetic basis because when the um, nose turtles are infants, they also have an angle of peripherals, as you can see. Yeah. Right, and I'll just go back to try and get for a second. We have covered the um, structure of the epidermis, and trionacids have either a honeycomb texture or a striated texture, which is not present on the specimen. They have a plywood structure in the upper solid bone layer, and they also do not have peripherals. So we've said the first and third point, but we have not covered the middle points. So we'll just go into the plywood structure quickly. So the plywood structure is a pattern of ridges and peaks that support, support the surface culture, so they um, alternate between layers. And this is in line with this sort of up and down nature of the surface culture. And in thin section under a microscope and under a, um, a macroscope, even, you can see this structure. And I'll just talk about the thin section. So this is a thin section of the specimen, and the upper cortical layer and the calcareous bone down here is present, and there is no apparent plywood structure in this region. And there are growth lines which are wavy in line with the surface ornamentation. And this means that it is um, consistent with fossil histology of proteins. And there is also a possible nutrient for the cross section, which I'll get into in a moment. And so, as I said, we have growth lines present here, and there is an S-shaped sort of striation pattern. And this is consistent with Sharpie's fiber bundles, which is used to anchor the integuments onto the shell, as this species has no scoops on the shell. And so, quick summary so far, we've identified as the absolute buttress of the Great Hill during our Myosin Glycine boundary from the Black Rock Sandstone. And there is also a particular fossil has been discovered in Papua New Guinea previously from the early Myosin. And from that specimen, it was deduced from the operation that the specimen had been brought from a freshwater environment to a marine environment because it was found in a marine setting, and so was our specimen. And our specimen also has this operation present, and so we deduce that the same thing also happened to this fossil. So, quickly on the aquatic adaptations, there is a diplo structure is reduced in the visceral cortical bone layers of. Um, freshwater turtles, and this is present in the specimen. And nutrient pores, by observation of museum specimens of other trinocids and credibilities, are more abundant in the um, are more abundant in the freshwater turtles than they are in the sort of land tortoises. And therefore, there is a sort of implication that these nutrient pores may have a role with integral breathing. So some freshwater turtles, such as trionics, are known to um, breathe in the water through their epidermis and their um, mouth as well. And this is also important for them when they hibernate, so they can hibernate in the water, so they do desiccate during hibernation. And there is an implication, therefore, that the nutrient pores and the abundance of them may be an adaptation to oxygen uptake or nutrient intake from the epidermis. But more research on this is needed to confirm this hypothesis. And I'll just quickly go into the cavity biogeographical implications. So P161476 is the most southern record of credibility um, in the entire world. As I said, the upper contender is from Papua New Guinea. And it is the youngest credibility in the fossil record by eight and a half million years. So this specimen, if it's confirmed as credibility, would extend their range to the late Miocene, early Pliocene, and it would extend them to southern Australia. And divergence times from the phylogeny of other predicates implicate that they had a sort of northern hemisphere or Laurasian descent. And the first occurrence is also, yeah, first occurrence of predicate was on the border of Australia. So if it isn't from Gondwana, then we have to talk about the migration of the Pipinose turtle. For its origins there. 
So it was originally for, as I said before, that they migrate from Papua New Guinea into the Northern Territory. And um, with the presence of the specimen in Southern Australia, it's possible that they went from the Northern Territory now to Papua New Guinea, because in five more years they were present in Southern Australia, which hints at an abundance of them on the Australian continent, but more Australian predicated fossils would be required to advance. And there is one more theory as well. This region here is a language between Papua New Guinea and Australia that existed around 100,000 years ago. And therefore, that theory um, implicates that they may have um, been abundant in sort of the land bridge region. However, this isn't consistent with the cave paintings which were found around 7,000 years ago. So, if this is really the earliest record of them in Australia, it wouldn't be consistent with the land bridge hypothesis. All right, so conclusions. P161476 is the first record of the family in Kerala Day in Australia. It highlights the importance of fragmentary turtle shell material, and I went over the aquatic adaptations, and it presents new evidence into the origins of the most turtle that lives in modern Turkey and Papua New Guinea. And with more, this is Yeah, thank you. interested in fossil turtles in Australia and she was going through the collections and she noticed that it had the sort of surface orientation. And Eric thought originally that it was from a trionite, which was one of the suspects, because he noticed a picture of a trionite in that paper. And then he contacted an expert from Germany and he said it also may be consistent with gray fields, because it reminded the orientation might be more gray fields. And obviously if it was a gray field it would have very widespread applications because there's no gray fields found in Australian fossil record, even though they are living in Australia in the present day and nowhere else. And so that's sort of what motivated us to study in this framework. Yes? Uh, I have a message about the Australian fossil record. Uh, so, what is the fossil? The fossil is around 5 to 6.2. And so the um, next earliest contender in the fossil record for Freddie Gillies, therefore, is around 30 years old. Any more questions? Yeah, I'm asking that. Getting involved with this project. Um, well, it wasn't through my university course, as it usually seems to be the case. I actually saw an advertisement for the um, conference. Uh, and so I was planning on submitting something from the university for it, but then I was talking to Eric, who was like, oh, do you want to do some fun research on fossils? And I was like, yeah, of course I do. And so, yeah, we went through the options probably the time frame I had, so it was around like four months. And so we narrowed it down to this. I think it was the best candidate to do the presentation. Yeah. All right, do you have any questions? Thank you, James. And we do have a school session um, 